Exodus 24, verse 1. Then God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, the 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and the rules. And the people answered with one voice and said, All the words of the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. So watch what just happened. God spoke the Ten Commandments and the covenant, which was Exodus chapters 20 through 23. He spoke those words. Now Moses writes it down on a piece of leather or a piece of parchment that they rolled up. Uh, We don't know exactly what he wrote it down on, but he writes down the Ten Commandments on a piece of paper, parchment, leather, and this whole covenant that God basically said, if you follow my commands, I as your God will protect you. I'll bring you into a good land. That's my promise to you as God. That's the covenant. So Moses is writing it down. Verse 4, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, which he had just got done writing, and he read it in the hearing of the people, And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood from the basin and threw it on the people. And he said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up to the mountain, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven or the very uh, sky for clearness. And God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel, for they beheld God, and there they ate and they drank. And the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction." So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you, and whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called out to Moses from the midst of the cloud, Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So in our country, we have a thing called lawyers. We have any lawyers in here? Anybody that practices law? Pass the bar? Anybody? Anybody? A couple? Okay. Those of us that are like, I forget that, I'll just care about the, I'll care about the law once I get arrested or whatever. Once you, once, once you get a ticket or you get arrested, you start looking at the law and you start caring, right? You start flipping through everything like, man, I got to get these statutes right because if I go to court, I want to know exactly what's going on. Now realize that some people spend their whole lives studying the law. We call them lawyers. They are, we pay them a very handsome sum of money usually to be experts in the law. And today Moses, who's a shepherd, God snags him out of the desert to be a sh- from being a shepherd to rescue his people, to bring them out to Mount Sinai. That guy, Moses, the shepherd guy, he is going to go up on the mountain and he's going to take a 40-day law class. And Moses is going to pass the bar and become a lawyer at the end of 40 days. He is going to get the law of God. And he's going to come down and be the mediator between a perfect God and a sinful nation. Because he has the law, and he tells the people what the law says. That's Moses' job as a lawyer from God. And I don't know how many lawyers we could say are from God, but Moses actually was from God and told people the law. Told people the righteous requirements of being his people. So number one, Moses gets God's covenant. Moses gets God's covenant. 
After being led by God through the uh, Sinai Desert, Israel finally encamped a short distance away from Mount Sinai. From the mountain, God spoke the Ten Commandments out of a storm of fire, smoke, lightning, and an earthquake. The Ten Commandments were the high points and overview of the whole law, which they had not received yet. So they're going to get the whole law uh, later once that's, that's your book of uh, Leviticus. But they get the, a huge chunk of it right here. Moses wrote down the covenant from God that he promised to take care of them if they would obey it. God's word demands a response. Listen, God's word demands a response. My words do not demand a response. You can, you can take or leave my words, right? You're like, oh, the pastor of the orchard said X, Y, Z, uh, maybe we'll follow that. But it's different if I'm speaking from God's word, God's word to you, right? That's different. Let me go on a side trail to catch this. Understand that when we gather here, we listen to God's word. It's not my opinion. It's not what I like to say. It's not even, it might not even be what I agree with in my own personal life. But the reality is, is that my life doesn't matter. What I say doesn't matter unless it aligns with God's word. Everybody with me? The reality of God's word means that you don't get to choose if you like it or not. You just get to choose if you obey it or not. True worship of God is not listening to the, to the word of God. True worship of God is not singing to God. True worship of God is not coming to a quote-unquote church. True worship of God is when you obey the word of God. God doesn't care about your singing. He doesn't care about me speaking. He doesn't care about nice facilities. What God cares about is your heart. Are you going to follow God or no? Are you going to listen to the words of God and follow the word of God? That's true worship of God. You can't say you worship God. Many times we say, oh, I worship God today, or the worship was really good, or the sermon was really good, or whatever. Realize that true worship comes from you, you acting out the word of God in your own life. That's true worship of God. Everybody with me? That's what true worship is. So you can't say, I worship God, but I don't really follow God's word. You can't say that. Worship and action go hand in hand. Now, today, God is going to give the people the law. This is what it means to be my people. Now, me as, as a pastor, uh, I, I don't know if you realize this, but the reason we actually take God's word and teach it is because God's word means something for our lives, and we are bound to follow it. Or we can say, I reject that, but it's up to us. My job is to make sure that what God says gets into your ears. So in our culture, there's many different ways that you hear the word of God taught. One of the worst ways, and, and it actually it's not even teaching God's word, is when pieces of verses are taken out all over the Bible and they're slapped down on a piece of paper and, and the pastor or whatever goes, this is kind of the idea of what I think God's word says. That's a disaster. You know why it's a disaster? Because many times they pull things out of context of what it originally meant, and you get a totally different reason for why God wrote that. Listen, in the same way that when you sat through your literature class in college, remember that, remember that big tome that you had to read in, in, in your literature class and it was like war and peace or something like that? You don't get to choose if the shark decides to attack. <laughs> it's from our VBS and it's on the loose. Now the shark's going back in the closet, so you're, you can uh, rest assured we won't get eaten. Realize this. In, in literature, in a test, if you read the book, you get an essay test and goes, what was the reason John went to the store? You don't get to make up your own context. Oh, he went to the store because he's being chased by a, a shark. No, in the context of the book, John went to the store because mom asked him to, or whatever the story is. Same thing with teaching the Bible. Context is king. If you tell somebody out of context what the verses are, that, does, that means that you have no idea what God originally meant, and you have no idea how to follow that word. So in our culture, there's a lot of uh, different ways of teaching the Bible, but understand, you have to be taught actually what God's word says. Not what a pastor wants you to hear, or what a, a hodgepodge of verses slammed together from the Old Testament may or may not mean. 
And here's the reason that's important for me as a pastor. Because when we die, the number one question will be, are your sins forgiven? That's the number one question. So the gospel to me is, my sins are forgiven because Jesus took my, my punishment on the cross. I can never make up for my sin by being a good guy. I can't do 14 good things and get into heaven. My sin outweighs any good I could ever do. So Jesus has to take my punishment on the cross. So when I die, Jesus says, why should I let you into heaven? And I say, Jesus, it's not for anything I've ever done. It's because of what you did for me. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Regardless of our sin, if we repent, God forgives you. That's the beauty of the gospel. Watch this, though. After I exit that judgment, this is exiting judgment, I guess, through the first judgment, you know what happens to me as a pastor? Is I undergo a second judgment. James says, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Because you will undergo a stricter judgment. And that literally means the author of this book sits me down. I don't know if it'll be a real sit down. But imagine Jesus asking you, that's not what I meant when I said that in the Bible. Why in the world did you teach somebody something that's not accurate? Can you not read English or Hebrew or whatever I wrote? Imagine undergoing a secondary judgment from God about how well you handled his word. That's what the Bible says about pastors and teachers. It goes, I love that James goes, hey, you want to be a pastor? Don't. He doesn't go, oh, you know what? You, you can't do anything else? Then just go to seminary and be a pastor. Because you're so worthless to society, just go do something. Maybe a pastor it'll be your, your, your calling. Nope. James says, you know what? You want to be a pastor? Don't do it. Make sure it's from God. Because God will hold you accountable to how you preach. And here's the reason this is important for today. Is when you hear God's word, you have to respond. When Moses spoke God's word, the covenant, the people responded to God. That when they heard God's word, they didn't just go, eh, that's pretty good. I don't really like Moses' delivery too much. It's a little, I wish he wore a suit and a tie, but other than that, it was okay. And I, I might think about following that. Nope, doesn't matter how it gets to you, is when it gets to you, you go, I'll change. Because it's, it's, it's incumbent upon me to make sure God's word is taught accurately. It's incumbent upon all of us to make sure when we hear it, we act. And the people responded to God's word when they heard it. So, that being said, it's Whatever church you go to or whatever church you commit to, make sure you're hearing God's word and not just Bible verses slammed together on a piece of paper. Everybody with me? Because context is king. You can take any Bible verse and make it say whatever you want it to say if you take it out of context. In the same way, you can yank something out of a novel and go, this is what I believe about it, but it's not what the original author intended it to say. That's why it's huge. Be somewhere you hear God's word so that you can hear and apply. And that's exactly what happened to the Israelites when they heard God's word. They, they heard it and they responded to it. The Israelites were uh, not only to obey this, things they had heard from God, but they were to be, obey the voice of his angel who had the character of God and was involved with judging sin and was probably a theophany of Jesus. Look how amazing this is. So you're in Exodus 24. Go to Exodus 23, the chapter right before it. Exodus 23 Verses 20 through 23. Exodus 23, verse 20 through 23. So the Hebrew word, probably translated in your uh, Bible or your Bible app, it says, uh, I will send my angel, angel ahead of you. Uh, the Hebrew word there, balak, uh, means messenger. So it can be translated angel because many times God sends angels to do his work, right? Anybody remember when uh, the angel was sent to Mary as a virgin? Uh, and, and the angel spoke to her about, hey, you're going to become pregnant even though you've never uh, slept with a man. That's God sending his angel to be his messenger. So they translate many times messenger, angel, because God sends angels to, to do his work. But it doesn't necessarily always mean it's an angel proper. It can be just a messenger. Like when you send your kid next door to get, like if you're, if you're baking brownies and you, you're an egg short. Now this is old school. Many of us go, I don't even know my neighbor. I don't even know what eggs they've got, so I'm just run down to Walmart or whatever. But back in the day, you would send your kid next door. Yes, Johnny? Uh, Mom's baking some brownies, and uh, we need an egg. 
And your neighbor theoretically would go to the refrigerator, pull out an egg, and give it to your son. You as an adult have made your child a malak, a messenger. Go ask my neighbor for something. Go ask my neighbor for this thing. Now, your kid is probably not an angel. Those of us that have children, we say amen, God bless you for that. Um, Your children are probably not angels, but they are many times your messengers when you send them to go say something to someone. And that's the idea here. Look at this. I want to set a background for this. Not one time in the Bible are angels proper. So you have, you have angels, the real flying around angels, invisible to us, our, our physical eyes. We've got humanity, angels, and divinity. This is the triplicate of our reality. And then you've got animals over here, but they don't, they don't make it in this, in this trinity of, of beings. I want you to understand, angels are never allowed to make judgments on someone's sin. It's God who always does that. Angels just are the speakers. They are the messengers. They tell the word of God. They don't ever make judgments on someone's sin. But look at what this messenger is able to do in Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I send an angel or a messenger or a malak before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him And obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name or my character or my likeness is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. And when my angel or my messenger goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites, to the Berezites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, I will blot them out. Understand that I believe this is a pre-incarnated, so Jesus came in the Virgin Mary uh, as a baby. He, he inf- God enfleshed himself. It's what incarnation means. You incarnated yourself as God. You took on flesh. Previous to Mary, 3,000 years earlier, I believe Jesus as God shows up right here as the angel sent to lead Israel. He, he came as the messenger. He's not an angel in an angelic sense, but he's the messenger of God. Come as God to lead Israel. Because angels are never allowed to deal with someone's sin. Only God deals with that, right? Because when we sin, we offend God, not people or angels. So I believe that Jesus, even before he enfleshed himself as God, was still leading the people of Israel as the messenger from the Lord. A theophany a presentation of God from the invisible to the visible. Everybody with me? A little bit heavy, a little bit heavy theology, but I want, I want you to run with that for a second. Because Jesus didn't just show up going, oh gosh, when's Mary going to get ready? I got I to gotta get, gotta get with this program here. Mary, let's, let's get rolling. Uh, we're still a thousand years away. Okay, I'm just going to hang out up here. Nope. Jesus as God has always been involved in the lives of humans since the day he built Adam. And he shows up here as the messenger of God to lead the people of Israel. Oxen were often sacrificed, or or were then sacrificed, as their innocent blood was used to ratify the covenant and as a peace offering between sinners and a perfect God, which also mirrored the sacrifice of Jesus. And we see that out of Colossians uh, 1, 19 and 20. That in this particular instance, they took an oxen, an innocent ox, and they slit its throat and it bled out into a basin, and they took the blood from the, from the ox, and they spread some on the altar, and it says that Moses took some, and he threw it over the people. So you've got a million people gathered in this valley, and he symbolically takes this blood from the ox, and he, and he throws it all over the nation. And think about this. In our culture, we have a thing called a wedding. And you know what happens at a wedding? A covenant happens at a wedding. A covenant happens at a wedding. Even in our modern culture, a covenant happens. So whether you come to me for me to marry you if you're single or engaged, and we set up a time to get, for you to get married, you come to 
a ceremony where you've got a husband and wife and they stand before a pastor and he pronounces over you, do you sure, are you sure you know what you're doing? Are you sure you know what you're getting into? In fact, if you get married at the orchard here, we don't just marry you just because you want to get married. We have you go through what's called counseling. Because we want you to know what you're getting. And for many of us, if we would have gone to counseling before we got married, we would have gone, oh, hmm, I don't know if I want to do this so much. But in our day and age, man, you just jump in, you know what, gosh, I really want to be married. Sweetie, let's go to Vegas. We can go to the courthouse. Some justice of the peace can pronounce us husband and wife. We can run to Vegas. You can pull up to a drive through window with, you know, hey, with Elvis or whatever can marry you at the window for 1995. You can get, you know, Elvis to take your vows or whatever as you roll down the window. Uh, dude, in our day and age, marriage doesn't even mean anything because we think in the back of our head, oh, the minute I don't like you anymore, I'm just going to dump you. I'm just going to divorce you and get married to someone else. But understand this. When you get married, in our culture even, it is the closest we can get to a biblical covenant. Because even in our culture, when you say your vows, for better, for worse, till... Till what? Till what? Till death do us part? That sounds like a blood covenant. Imagine if you, in, you were invited, some bride sends you her, her beautiful uh, invitation. You got it in the mail. Please come to John and Becky's wedding. And you're like, I would love to go to John and Becky's. I love John and Becky. And you get that invitation, and you put on your best dress, or you put on your best suit or whatever, and you show up, and there's this bull standing outside the, standing outside the church. You're like, is this an agricultural wedding or what? You pull up and you see a bull. All of a sudden, you see me as a pastor walk out with this knife. Shing! Slit the bull's throat. Bull starts bleeding out inside of this basin. You're like, what is going on at this wedding? Bull finally dies. Blood's in a basin. I walk up with this basin of blood. And you're sitting in the chair going, what is happening here? I thought this was a wedding. Yep. I take, I take some blood from the bull, I sprinkle it on the, the husband and the wife, gets all over her nice, beautiful white dr uh, dress that she paid $48,000 for. <laughs> and you're just sitting there going, what is this cultic weirdness that is happening here? And then I take the basin of blood and I go, shing! <laughs> and you go, dude, I am so out of here. I don't even care about John and Becky anymore. I am gone. And here's the reality of why that bull, bull's blood was shed. The bull's blood was shed so that by an innocent participant, he could show through his blood the severity of breaking the covenant. So what that meant for the nation was, whoever breaks this covenant deserves to die. Even in our culture, when you get married and you say, if we become multi-billionaires and we're living, uh, we own our own city and we become unbelievably wealthy, for better, I commit to you. If we become super poor and we're eating top ramen for every meal and we're living in the dirt, I commit to you. Whether you get sick as my husband, I will take care of you. Whether you get sick as my wife, I will take care of you. Whether we have sex for the rest of our lives, I will take care of you. Whether our sex life's amazing and off the charts, whether it hardly doesn't exist in zero. Whatever it is, whatever happens in our lives, I will, I will be here for you. You want to know how long it's going to be? Till the day I'm dead. Now, is that not a covenant? That is a covenant. And in our culture, it's like uh, we have something inside of our thing that's called irreconcilable differences. You know that was added in our contracts of divorce because we had to give people a way out. That wasn't always in our contracts for divorce. And understand this, when you say, I will die before I break this contract, you are entering into the deepest covenant that men and women can enter into. So much so that what you say to God and the pastor and each other is that no matter what happens, I'm going to die before this covenant's broken. And what, what that means is God, who is the only one that has authority to break a covenant, will decide when you or your spouse die 
When that day happens, you are free to go find another spouse because your vow has been broken, your covenant has been broken by the only one who can break it, and that's God. It gives you a different view of weddings, right? So, so if, I, if I counsel you, one, buckle up. Because you're going to get a whole lot about weddings you might not re- realize. But here's the reality. It doesn't matter if, if Elvis marries you. It doesn't matter if I marry you. It doesn't matter who marries you. You make a covenant before, before each other and God. And that's who it matters to. And I told my wife, I go, you know what? I hope you like me. Because we're going to be together until we're dead. Through better, for worse, we're here for each other. That's it. If you die before me, go find somebody else awesome. If you, die, uh, if you die before me, if God provides somebody else, awesome for me. If I die before you, go find somebody else awesome. But the reality is, is that until we're dead, we stay together. That's covenant. See how different that is from our culture? There's no irreconcilable differences in the covenant of God. And you know what's weird about covenanting with God? Is that God never dies. It's really sketchy to make a covenant with a God that never dies. He will never let you down, and he will never die. So that means that it's incumbent upon us to follow the laws of God, to follow God. God covenants with us because he loves us, and he will never break his covenant of love with us. So by his grace, we enter his covenant, and we move forward with God leading us. That's what it means to enter a covenant with people, and with God. Heavy duty, right? Wow. What if we took marriage that serious? What if we actually did what our covenant said? Which is like, I know you hate me right now, but we're going to die someday, and uh, then you're free to go somewhere else. But until that day, we're together. God is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. And we see that in Matthew 26, 27, and 28, where Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. We take communion every week because it reminds us of the blood of Christ, that Jesus is a covenant-making God, and that he is willing to transform our lives. He never dies. He never lets us down. He will never break our covenant. And when we enter into a covenant with him by repenting of our sin, God is good to his promise, which is, I will protect you and I will save you. Number one, Moses gets God's covenant. Number two, Moses gets God's law. Moses becomes a lawyer right here. Moses becomes a lawyer of God's word. The book of the covenant, which Moses wrote, was left with the people as the priests, 70 elders, and Joshua and Moses went to the base of the mountain and saw God. This vision included viewing his feet on a magnificent sapphire platform, and it was not a total view of God, which would have cost them their lives. So if you don't know what sapphire is, uh, sapphire is a crystal clear blue stone, and it's very similar to the sky. So the elders and Moses and, and the priests come to the edge, the base of the mountain, and God allows them to see him. And, it, and all they could view was God's feet, but they viewed God. And his feet was like on this sapphire, uh, perfectly transparent blue platform, and they were able to see God without God killing them because it wasn't a total view of God's holiness, which we would never survive if God showed, us to, showed himself to us in his purity. But then look what else happens. Then they ate a meal with God in covenant fellowship. Imagine eating with God. Imagine having dinner with God. So think about this. In your wedding, for most of us, once you got done with your ceremony, what did you do? What did you do? You went, you went, you went and ate, right? So it doesn't matter if you're dirt poor and you're like, we're just having carrots and a ranch dip. Or like if you had steak and lobster for everybody. You know what's interesting? is after a covenant, you eat. Even in our culture. We eat after we make one of the greatest covenants humans can make with one another. I don't know how many weddings I've done, but after every single one of them, I go, okay, now uh, we're going to clear this place and we're all going to eat together. Because you want to know why that is? Once you make a covenant with people, you should be at peace. And you know one of the most difficult things to do when you're not at peace? 
with people is eat with them. You ever had like tension at your, at your dinner table? I'm not even going to look at you. I'm going to look at the corner of this table. Silence. Tension. It's interesting that when you're not at peace, it's very difficult to eat. It's very difficult to enjoy your food. But you know what's beautiful? When you're at peace, man, you sit down. It's like Thanksgiving, right? So Thanksgiving's coming up in a few months. If you have a really awesome family and an extended family, man, everybody gathers around the table. You put out extra tables. You got all the kids screaming and running around with, you know, turkey hats on or whatever. And you, if you're, if you're a, a homemaker, you spend your whole day or even the day before just getting ready because you want that to be the best meal possible. You want to know why that is? It's because people love food, but ultimately it's that Norman Rockwell type of vibe where you just sit around the table, everybody loves each other, there's no tension, there's no weirdness, you just eat together and you fellowship together and you love life. But you know what's bad is when you invite like weird Uncle Johnny, like, dude, who invited John? Oh my gosh. You know what we need to do? We need to move so John doesn't know where we live. And we can just have Thanksgiving with everybody that's awesome in our family. But instead, Grandma keeps inviting weird Uncle John. And, you know, John shows up and he's like, Bleh! he's hammered on, you know, Jägermeister or whatever, just talking crazy. And you're like, gosh, I just wanted peace for one meal together as our family. And John just blah, 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 blah. Government, UFOs, whatever he's talking about, I'm just so tired of it. Right? So here's the, here's the point. Inside of your family should be covenant. Here's ideally how it should work. I want to lay out to you the ideal. Okay, this may not be true of you right now, but I want to lay out the ideal for you. A husband and wife in our society, covenant, I'm going to die before we get divorced. We have children theoretically. This means children. We have children theoretically. And as those children grow, even around our dinner table or around the little bar at your, at your uh, you know, kitchen, you have a meal together. That is an evidence, watch, the peace and eating, even in our family nuclear unit, is an evidence of the covenant that mom and dad made with the kids. They're, they're, they're a product of the covenant, and we eat around the table in peace. That's the ideal, right? We as a church do the same thing at, at communion. Is we eat around the table of the Lord, so to speak, in peace with one another. You want to know why? Because we made a covenant with God through Christ. And we are at peace with God, the same way the elders met with God. They, they agreed to the covenant with the bowl, remember? They agreed to that covenant, so God says, we're at peace. Come up and let's eat. And the elders come up to the base of the mountain, and they eat with God in peace. The covenant has brought peace, and now we can eat together. We still do it in our culture today. After six days... God called Moses, so he left Joshua, entered the storm where God was, and became the mediator between God and man. So in the Old Testament, Moses is kind of like the Jesus figure who, who reaches God and is a man, and he, he's a mediator. He goes between God and man. He goes up to the mountain to connect with God and then comes back down and tells the people what they must do. So Moses is kind of the Jesus of the Old Testament After six days, God called him, and so he left Joshua. God's timing is rarely our timing. Amen? God's timing is rarely our timing. We want things to happen. Where's my job? Why isn't my marriage getting better? Why are my kids so lame? Why doesn't, why doesn't my life get better? I pray about these things. Maybe God doesn't care or God's not real. Understand this. God will not answer all of your prayers in the moment you say them because then you view God as a vending machine. God will not be manipulated. Sometimes we ask for things that aren't even good for us. We ask for something that looks like bread, but it's, it's a stone shaped as a loaf of bread. And we go, God, why can't I have that bread? And God's going, because it's a rock. But God, the bread, the bread, the bread. And God's going, wow, give up on the uh, bread because it's actually a stone. Sometimes we ask for things that God goes, that's not my will for you. It's going to destroy you. 
So sometimes God says no, but many times God says wait. You want to know why God says wait? It's because he puts your faith to the test. Moses sat for six days. God said, I want you to come up to me, and I'm going to call you when I want you to finally walk up to, to see me. Moses sits for six days, day one, day two, day three, day four. I mean, after about day five, he's like, well, it's like a week. Day six, and finally God goes, now come up. God's timing is not always our timing. Don't get mad at God. Don't give up. Don't run ahead of God. Don't lag behind God. Run with God and step with him. And the way you know that is you pray to God that he will give you peace as you take every step. That's what we've been doing as a church. We're asking God to lead us. We don't want to run ahead. We don't want to fall behind. We want to stay in step. Imagine if Moses would have gone, you know what? I'm going to go up to God whenever I feel like it. He enters that, that storm, boom, dead. Moses comes tumbling back down. And Aaron's like, whoa, what is this? God goes, okay, Moses is dead because he didn't listen and he didn't wait. I choose you now to come on up and I'm going to tell you when. And Aaron would have been like, okay, I'm just going to sit right here. You just let me know when. Never be presumptuous in your relationship with God. Wait on God and God will answer your prayer. Either no or just wait. Sometimes he answers it right away, which those are awesome days, right? Jesus, I need some money. Ding, here's some money. Jesus, you're real. That's awesome. Sometimes you say, Jesus, I need some money. And he goes, okay, well, you shouldn't have spent $438 on that uh, coach purse last month. So I'm not going to give you money right now. So if you can eat your purse, go ahead and do that. <laughs> so you mismanage your finances. So don't get mad at me when you're just asking for some more money. Sometimes God says, wait. I'll be faithful to you, but just wait. Don't get impatient. I love you, so hang on. That's what it does for Moses. And Moses finally waits, and he enters God's presence. Many times God will let us wait to produce disappointment. You ever been disappointed in God? Why didn't I get married? Why don't I have the right kids? Why don't I have the right house? Why don't I have the right job? You ever been disappointed with God? Been angry? Understand that God is moving in your life. God will not always do things your way and your timing, but God loves you. God has covenanted with you if you've come to Jesus. God will never fail you, but he won't give you everything in your timing because God's timing is different than ours many times. doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It just means that I want you to walk with me in faith. Part of being faith-filled with God is that you're going to be there's going to be seasons where you're going to be disappointed because God hasn't given you what you wanted. But that's part of walking in faith. For the next 40 days, God gave Moses instructions about the ark, tabernacle, and priestly responsibilities. Moses was also given two Ten Commandments written by God on stone, which completed God's reason of rescuing Israel. And that was to worship him. You see that in Exodus 3.12, all the way back at the burning bush, Moses heard from God that the end game was to bring the people out of Egypt and bring them to the mountain of God, which is exactly where they ended up. God promised Moses he would do it, and he fulfilled it right here when he got the law at the mountain. Worship is an action and not a feeling. So we talked about do not steal. Four weeks ago. Where are my kleptos at? Did you not steal for the last four weeks? You bring those pens that you had in your uh, office at home back to the office? Anybody? All the paper that you spent on your own uh, printer? Did you bring it back? Or buy some from Costco or whatever and bring it back to the... They're like, why do we have all this extra paper here at the office? Oh, I just thought I'd bring a present back to the office. <laughs> and you took like 14 reams. Where are my liars at? Now, you're probably going to lie to me about saying you didn't lie, so I'm not even going to ask. <laughs> the point is you have to apply. You can't just hear without applying. Real worship of God is not singing, listening to a nice sermon, sitting in air conditioning. Real worship is that when you go home, you're different than when you, when you came here. That you become a better wife to your husband, who you've covenanted with. That you become a better husband to your wife that you covenanted with. That if your children... You just listen to mom and dad. 
Praise God. That in everything we do, we worship God, not by how we think about God, but by how we act with what we've heard from God. The true words of God, who loves us, but asks us to change.